We all have our favourite games, but more importantly, we all have our favourite parts of our favourite games. Think retrieving the Blades of Chaos in God of War 2018, or Oblivion's Whodunit Quest. These moments are the ones that stick with you through the ages and define gaming at its finest. Being able to not only experience these moments, but to control them and drive them ourselves is what makes gaming so special as a medium. But for every breaking the bank at Caligula's in Grand Theft Auto, there's inevitably going to be a wrong side of the tracks or supply lines to even the whole experience out. Yes, there are levels so awful that they give you pause when you dig out an old favourite for a bit of nostalgic fun. There's little worse than burning through a series of endlessly entertaining missions only to hear All we had to do was follow the damn train, CJ! over and over again until it haunts your nightmares and every waking moment of your life. So, let's pay tribute to all of those water temples, vulnerable NPCs, and forced stealth sections, and remind ourselves why you should maybe leave those classics well alone. I am the bonus round of Ash from What Culture Gaming, and these are 10 terrible levels that stopped you replaying great video games. 10. The Tank Chase Jack 2 Renegade Jack 2, Naughty Dog's sequel to their platformer Jack and Daxter, has an incredibly strong opening. After a beginning level featuring a thrilling escape sequence and new and improved combat, we get a glimpse of the new world we're about to explore. However, a mere three missions into the game, all that wonder and goodwill seeps away. A task for the Resistance sees Jack and Daxter head to a fortress to destroy an ammo cache, resulting in them being chased by a security tank. The player is forced to navigate a series of corridors bordered by bottomless pits, all the while making tricky maneuvers to dodge fire from the tank's turret. This early on in the game, players likely won't have had the chance to master the unpredictable roll jumps necessary to survive this gauntlet, and you'll be finding out what's at the bottom of those pits a great deal. Considering that at this point you're also confined to a tiny portion of the sandbox map and have no weapons, there is no real fun to be had in the open world either. In an otherwise excellent work, this mission serves like no other to start the game off on the wrong foot. 9. The Blindness Shard Trial Hellblade Sinuous Sacrifice Around the halfway point of the genuinely wonderful and entirely underrated Hellblade, we are introduced to the Four Trials of Odin, which Sinua must complete in return for a powerful sword which will allow her to kill Hela, Queen of Helheim. Three of these trials can be completed without incident save for a little bit of head scratching. But then, you come to the Blindness Shard Trial. Sinua is thrust into darkness, with a disembodied voice telling her only to feel. The player must then navigate a near pitch black house with poorly explained mechanics and are at the mercy of an unseen monster which will insta-kill them at the slightest provocation. Accidentally get too close to the monster in the pitch black house because it is pitch black and you can't see anything, dead. Bump into an object in the pitch black house because it's pitch black and you can't see anything, dead. Stand in the same place for too long because you have no real idea what to do in the pitch black house because it's pitch black and you can't see anything, dead. Turn off the PS4 and go outside, understandable. 8. Writer's Block The Warriors The Warriors is pure, brutal brilliance, but that doesn't mean that it's perfect. Where the game stumbles is the mission Writer's Block, which features a chase across the rooftops of New York at the mercy of the Hi-Hats, a gang of evil mimes. This sounds like a nice little set piece, and it really could have been, but its execution is just so, so frustrating. There are instant death drops everywhere, and without any checkpoints, the chase becomes an infuriating case of trial and error. This is made even worse when playing split-screen with a friend. When traversing the rooftops, one fall from either player is an instant game over, resulting in far less room for error. Luckily, the mission culminates in the characters landing in an enemy's art gallery and getting to smash up all of his crap artwork, thus allowing the players to take out their frustration on some digital sculptures rather than each other. 7. Meat Circus – Psychonauts Tim Schafer's Psychonauts is an absolute joy to play. Its mix of varied, innovative platforming action, sharp humour, and clever world-building makes for an almost perfect experience. The game offers a cornucopia of levels unparalleled in their imagination. Each area is a representation of a character's psyche, taking the form of twisted 70s dance floors, suburbs overrun by shady government agents, and a city at the bottom of the ocean inhabited by plankton. But at the end of this journey is the game's final test of patience, the Meat Circus. The Meat Circus is a hellscape of the worst kind. The player must make their way to the top of a gigantic circus tent, made from, well you guessed it, meat. 
The platforming is unforgiving and the game's uncooperative camera only compounds this. Not helping matters at all is the additional fact that this extremely difficult platforming gauntlet doubles as an escort quest, with protagonist Raz's stupid friend running on ahead and getting repeatedly beaten up by angry mangled bunny carcasses. This adds a frustrating ticking clock element to a section which could have been bearable had the player had the time to take the platforming carefully. Sadly, we are not afforded that luxury. 6. Blight Town – Dark Souls Dark Souls occupies a place on this list for reasons very different from the usual fare of insane difficulty, poor design, or out-of-place mechanics. I mean, the games require a great deal of patience to get on board with, but are generally seen as being tough but ultimately fair by big FromSoft nerds. But then, the subterranean, disease-ridden slum of Blight Town throws this whole notion out of the gammy window. The location itself is not especially difficult by design. It's tricky but not unbearable. But its issue lies in its shockingly poor optimization. With its large draw distance rife with clutter and an overabundance of complex particles, the frame rate when traversing the putrid city frequently drops to around 15 frames per second. For a game whose mechanics are heavily focused on frame-perfect combat, this kind of lag makes it virtually unplayable. Combat becomes so frustratingly difficult that it seemingly makes more sense to avoid enemies altogether, thus leaving the player underleveled for the challenges that lie ahead. It might not have mattered so much if the area was pretty, but it is basically a shanty town made of poo, and therefore visually repugnant. 5. Ship Stealth Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag was a breath of fresh, salty sea air for a franchise that was getting a tad stale. Sailing the gorgeous waters of the Caribbean, plundering passing ships, and just being a general nautical nuisance was swashbuckling at its heartiest. Plus, that one guy with the golden voice who leads the sea shanties, ugh, brings a tear to the eye. Sure, the game lost a lot of its fun factor every time it remembered it was an Assassin's Creed game and forced the player to skulk around in bushes eavesdropping on passing numpties, but it was always just a matter of time until you could board the jackdaw and shiver some more timbers. It turns out, though, that unfortunately, gigantic, unwieldy ships are more suited to firing broadsides at each other against the backdrop of the open ocean than they are at silently navigating bayous in the dead of night, as is demonstrated in the mission The Siege of Charlestown. Here, the player must somehow direct the jackdaw awkwardly through painfully narrow passages of water, speeding up and slowing down every few seconds to avoid being spotted and booted back to the checkpoint. It is both tedious and frustrating, and you will be begging to get back to the high seas. 4. Proving Grounds – Bioshock No game with near-perfect gameplay is complete without a horrible escort quest, as Bioshock well knows. After many hours of beefing up your turtlenecked hero with, amongst other things, the power to shoot bees out of your hands at people, you are the ultimate badass. You fought your way through countless big daddies and cornered their surrogate daughters. Whether you gave them a soothing pat on the forehead or less soothingly snapped them in half is your business alone. Reaching the Proving Grounds, the penultimate section of the game, you are tasked with gathering the parts necessary to become a big daddy yourself. Sounds great, right? Wrong. Sadly, it turns out that being a big daddy isn't actually fun at all. You don't get a giant drill hand like all the others, and what you do get is a little sister, who you then have to escort between various corpses to harvest, defending her from waves of splicers as she takes her goddamn time. Suddenly, a high-octane supernatural shooter has become a tedious tower defense game. The developers of Bioshock 2 must have written the design document on opposite day, as this atrocious aspect is bizarrely made central to the entire game in that one. 3. Labyrinth Zone – Sonic the Hedgehog I can hear the cries of the mob already. How dare I criticize the original Sonic the Hedgehog in such a way? It's a classic! However, going back to the Blue Blur's original outing only proves one thing. Sonic the Hedgehog may be a classic, but hang on just one second. The opening stages are a masterclass in level design, with paths carefully laid out to wow the player with just how fast Sonic could go. Next comes the Marble Zone, which slows the gameplay down in service of waiting for blocks to move out of the way and traversing lava pits on slow-moving platforms. The Spring Yard Zone is better, but is mired in confusing navigation and slow-paced platforming. And then we have the Labyrinth Zone. You immediately descend into a pit of water, which slows your top speed to a crawl, limits your jumping ability, and of course introduces an exciting new gameplay feature, which is drowning. Who can forget that terrifying, panic-inducing, ever-accelerating drowning theme as you desperately try to waddle over to one of the all-too-rare air pockets only to die, respawn, die again, and finally wrench a cartridge from your Mega Drive and punt it across the room? 
a classic indeed. 2. Chapter 13 Redemption Final Fantasy XV While many of the previous entries could be up for debate to at least a degree, Final Fantasy XV's infamous 13th chapter is an experience so bad that a patch was released allowing the player to avoid the frustrating main path entirely, confirming what players thought of the whole sorry affair. The chapter, titled Redemption, sees the characters separated from each other by way of a lazily executed deus ex machina in the form of a fallen train car. Player character Noctis is left alone and weaponless, stuck in a series of uninspired industrial corridors, hiding from patrolling enemies. While in theory this might work, the player can only hide in designated alcoves via a contextual button press rather than anything as organic as breaking line of sight or sticking to the shadows. This goes on not for simply a brief spell, but for the best part of two frickin' hours. No thank you. 1. The entire first act. Middle-earth Shadow of War if there is one thing worse than a chapter so bad it was patched out, it is an entire act so bad it should have been patched out, but wasn't. We begin Middle-earth's Shadow of War having lost the ring to Shelob, now retconned into a sexy lady in a cocktail dress because of reasons, and on the back foot defending Minas Ithil from an army of besieging Uruks. The free-flowing, visceral combat from the game's excellent predecessor is still there, if somehow a little less refined, but one thing is missing the ability to dominate Uruks and assimilate them into your army. Granted, it is unwise to give a player everything to play with at once, but building a personal army of colourful misfits was the entire premise that the game was marketed on. Instead, we're treated to around 8 hours of repetitive combat with no real reward, and the only thing that feels new at this point is a loot system that has a player constantly dipping in and out of menu screens, micromanaging their gear. Throw in a couple of incredibly frustrating boss battles and any player could be forgiven for giving up on the game entirely and missing out on what the rest of the story has to offer. And that's our list. What other awful levels stopped you getting back into old titles? Share your findings in the comments section below. I've been Ash and this has been What Culture Gaming. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and come back again soon for some more lovely gaming content. Thanks for watching.